Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Gabriel uh, for the very kind in invitation to come here. Uh, so he asked me to give a talk on a new perspective on something. And that something is uh, plant water movement in the phloem and the xylem. And uh, you have to ask a very simple question, which is, why study plants? So I'm a physicist. I teach at an engineering school. Why would I be interested in plants? Okay. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, and some are pretty obvious. So basically, all of what we eat, 95% of that comes directly or indirectly from plants, so all these nice crops. And they're not only from plants, right? So they have been made in this very special process, photosynthesis. So all the material you see inside these seeds have been made in a leaf, synthesized. So you capture energy from the sun, you store it in chemical energy, then you move it into these things, which are little, essentially, energy packets for embryos, and then we harvest it. So that's what the plant is doing. And so uh, this is all the stuff we eat, and also indirectly in the meat, of course, and then also with energy. And uh, so this is sort of a very good motivation for telling politicians or universities why we're interested in it. And essentially, we're interested in this, the sugar, right? That's what my main uh, research topic has been. How do you synthesize sugar? How do you move sugar? How do you extract sugar? How do you harvest it, right? If we can do that more efficiently, it would be really good for humanity. So I think that's a worthwhile goal to pursue. Uh, it's also economically very valuable. So there is a good opportunity for either earning a lot of money doing this or saving a lot of energy if we can do this better. So this is me talking to the funding agencies and all the <laughs> professionals. But this is another reason why I'm interested in this. And I want to try to illustrate that a little bit. So this is a picture of me and my kids, slightly younger version of me, in 2012 at a, at a fair in, in Topsfield, Massachusetts. So it's these sort of state fairs in the United States where all the farmers come and they compete. Who has the biggest tomato? Who has the... And this is a giant pumpkin. And uh, th they, they have a, a competition, so it's in Massachusetts, in the United States. And I think they are currently the leading in the United States at least. And so this particular pumpkin weighed in at around one metric ton. Okay. So it's amazing that you can groom an organism to produce a fruit of this size and mass. And I find that extremely fascinating. Okay. I, I think that's intrinsically interesting how you do this. I believe now the record is in Germany. <laughs> and where, so these are all, so th they have sort of like an offhand agreement that you grow plants outside, you don't use the greenhouse and so on. So in Germany, if you do it into, uh, inside and, and so on, you can get more than, more than this. Uh. But it's really big. I th first, when I saw it, I thought, oh, they have some plastic sculpture of what a big pumpkin is supposed to be. But this is actually the one. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what a plant really is. So here is some schematic of a plant and uh, sort of the, the business end of all the stuff that is synthesizing uh, sugars, or capturing energy from the sun that's up here in all the green tissue, so all the leaves, everything that's green on a plant. So in photosynthesis, sort of for photosynthesis, you need some, a few simple ingredients. You need some carbon dioxide. It's obtained from the atmosphere. So little holes in the leaf called stomata, shown here, I think, yeah. And uh, you also need uh, some water. So if you look at sort of the stem of a plant, sort of you need some water you obtain from the root. If you look at the stem of a plant, what the stem really is, it's like a super highway system for water. So what the plant is doing is that it's making it easier for water to go through the body of the plant than to evaporate from the surface of the soil. Okay, so that's an, an important point. That's really what the whole plumbing system of the plant is all about. You make a cross section of a plant, the chair you're sitting on right now, it's just pipes. Okay, it's just pipes for water, all of it, essentially. So water is taken up from the root and it's then uh, moves to the leaf. 
and it's driven by essentially just evaporation. So the air in this room may be 50% humidity. So if you have a chamber inside the leaf, 100% humidity, it can evaporate, it can diffuse out, and so on. So after you syn synthesize the sugars in these mesophyll green cells, it's uh, loaded into the floor, which is a separate vascular system, and then it's pumped. And we will we're pumped uh, around the plant, and we will talk in details about how this, this works. So essentially, you have these two separate vascular systems, xylem for water, phloem for sugar, and it's all this continual pipe network. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the water transport first. And so it's, it's important to say that, that plants need water. Okay, it's, it's almost trivial. You know, if you have a plant, you need to water it. And a good example is from, from, from last year, uh, which so since 2010 up until last uh, summer of last year, had a very severe drought in California. And so I looked up the statistics of how many trees had died, right? And so between May and uh, this is uh, November 2016, 36 million trees died. Okay, so that's like 200,000 a day. Okay, so because they don't have sufficient uh, amounts of water. So this also adds the effect that you have increased risk of wildfire, which is dangerous to humans, not just the plants dying and so on. And it also has obvious negative effects on crop yield, okay? So now I have a little question for you. And, and so the idea now is that you discuss with your neighbor why plants need so much water, okay? And this is not going to go on the internet or on the online or anything. Don't worry about that, okay? Okay, so let's have a little discussion for a few minutes, okay? Okay, let's try to continue. Let's try to continue. So. The question is, why do plants need so much water? And I had many good responses. So a fair group of people thought that it was to basically drag nutrients out of the soil, which is a, uh, an important effect. Uh, also, the question of how much water is really used in photosynthesis. And unfortunately, like I have to tell you that about 95% of the water that the plant pulls out of the soil is just evaporated. It's not used for any purpose whatsoever. So you can get all the nutrients you need, you can get all the water you need to uh, maintain all the cells inside. So let's look a little bit about the exchange of water for CO2, right? So the, the over here we have the basic process. So you want some CO2 to go in, and you can already see from this sketch here, which I took from a book, that quite a few water molecules will go out, okay? And the explanation for this is actually pretty uh, pretty simple, and this is like the first order explanation. There are many, many details to this, how the shape of the stomata influences, how the geometry of this cavity in here also influences all these effects, of course, right? But the basic problem we have is that we have some wet surface. So the blue surface here is inside the leaf. You have some wet cells, and above this layer of cells, you have essentially a 100% humidity. Okay, so there are a lot of water molecules sitting here. And outside in the atmosphere, you have some CO2 that you need to get in. And, I mean, you need to keep this system open. So for whatever reason, plants can only absorb CO2 on a wet surface. Okay, and this is sort of, a, uh, I would say, one of the most inefficient processes in nature. So there has to be a really good idea why it's not possible to do it some other way. If you could make a filter that could do this, that'd be great. But anyway, so <coughs> we see that you have a diffusive process. So meaning these are essentially molecules in gas phase that sit in the atmosphere. So all this is inside air. So inside the leaf, you have a high concentration of water vapor. Outside, it's relatively low. It could be 100% to 50%. So water will go out at some rate. CO2, we tend to think that there's a lot of CO2 in the air. Okay. So does anyone remember how much CO2 we have currently? Four hundred parts per million? Yes, that is correct. So we we tend to think that that's a lot, right? So for us and for our sort of uh, uh, environmental conscience and our convenience, it is a lot. But if you're from the perspective of a plant, it's actually quite little. So they need to 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 get this stuff out. Anyway, so the the rate of diffusion is determined by some physical parameters, right? So J here is the flux, so it's essentially the number of molecules per unit area per time. 
And so it's proportional to the concentration gradient and to the diffusivity, which is a material parameter that depends on essentially like the size of the molecules and the medium. So in this case, it would be water molecules in air or carbon dioxide molecules in air. And then it depends on the length scale, so like how far you have to go. Okay, if I impose a gradient over one meter, the transport will be slower than if it's over one nanometer. That makes sense. So this is the, the, the transport rate, right? And so for both processes, L here is the same, okay, which it turns out to be convenient for us. And so I can write down something like this. So the, the ratio of how many water to CO2 becomes the diffusivity of water multiplied by the concentration gradient divided by the same quantity for CO2, okay? So now I just need to know these numbers, okay? So we already had one, which is the concentration gradient for water, or uh, the, the concentration gra gradient from for CO2, which is these, maybe you go from 400 parts per million outside the leaf to a few 200 inside or something. Maybe you can go to zero if you're really efficient, but we also need the diffusion coefficients, and so they are uh, for for water and air and CO2 and air, they're pretty comparable, okay? So there's uh, the, the one molecule is slightly heavier than the other, so CO2 will tend to diffuse a little bit slower, so maybe the ratio is about 1.5. But it's not really a that big effect, right? So this number out here in front is essentially one, okay? So how about, what is the concentration of water in, in like at room temperature? Does anyone know? I told you that, that for the CO2 is maybe 400 parts per million. So does anyone know what, what, the, what, what the ratio is? Yes? Yes, I just mean like if you say I am in a room 100% humidity, how many like parts per million or mole or whatever unit you want, like kilograms. It Eight grams per one kilogram of air. Okay, okay, okay. So, th so the the if you say it in parts per million, right? A hundred percent humidity is roughly forty thousand parts per million, right? So you have a hundred times more water molecules. So in terms of mass, all this stuff depends on temperature. It's important to emphasize, right? But maybe at room temperature, you have something like twenty grams of water in a fully saturated atmosphere, so something like that. So it's but if you look at these two, basically if CO2 goes from 400 to 200 and water goes from 40,000 to 20,000, right? The ratio of these two, and I'm going to walk in here, is going to be uh, about 100, right? And the ratio of the diffusivity is 1.5, right? So we have 150. So just for this simple transport process, you get something which is uh, very bad for the plant, okay? So every time I want to take up one CO2 molecule, I have to exchange 150 water molecules. So think about that next time you water your plant, that it's really wasteful process. Okay. Um, so essentially, that, that's, uh, that th this is like the textbook explanation. I, I thought it, it was nice to, to start with some, some really uh, basic information on this uh, type of problem. Now, uh, when we talk about these diffusive processes, this is a very simple back-of-the-envelope calculation. I say something like uh, that the uh, diffusive flux is sort of roughly proportional, and this can be useful for estimating rough orders of magnitude, but sometimes we also want to do detailed calculations, okay? And I just want to, in this, this first lecture, just give a little bit of feel for how some of the tools are developed, right? So the, the idea is that I want to talk a little bit about diffusion and, and advection. So essentially diffusion is this molecular movement, so there is some thermal energy in the atmosphere, for instance, and that thermal energy transla translates into kinetic energy of gas particles. And gas particles will tend to bump into each other and effectively do this sort of billiard ball game moving around. And this means that if I have more billiard balls over here of a special kind and fewer here, they will tend to migrate, okay? 
And this migration, I write, so it's a diffusive flux here, which is proportional to diffusivity and then the gradient and concentration. So now it's no longer like delta C over L, but now it's really the local gradient. Okay, so that's one way that particles can move. Another way that particles can move is by advection. So essentially, if you have a current of air or a flow of water, and you have more particles over here than here, then if I'm sitting here, they can sort of move into my way. So that's the other way. So they can move by flow. So velocity times concentration, that gives you the same type of, of uh, flux. So essentially, I'm interested in if I have some volume in space, like the sort of oddly shaped potato I drew up here. If I know the volume omega, and if I know the boundary of this, so it's in a three-dimensional object, I would like to know how will the concentration of particles inside this volume, how will that involve in time, okay? And so I can write down some conservation equation, okay? And it's not to use too much mathematics, but uh, I just want to show you how these things are sort of developed. So the idea is to say, if I integrate a concentration over the volume of this thing over here, this uh, object, I get the number of particles. Okay, it's just counting the total number of particles. So the concentration might be depend on space, but if I integrate over all the space, I get the number of total number of particles. And then I, I take the time derivative of that. So I say how many particles go in or out. That's essentially what this left-hand side is. And then I can simply take, okay, so if I assume that they do not just like appear out of nothing, they have to come there by some process. And uh, as I just told you, there are two simple processes, diffusion and ad advection. So I have to integrate over the surface. So this simple here means the surface. So I, if it's a sphere, it's simply the surface of the sphere and so on. So I integrate over the surface. And then I have to take, you know, this flux plus that flux, and then I have to do the dot product with the normal. And so the normal in, in this case is a vector which is always a normal vector to the surface and always points outwards. So if the flow is into the, into the system, I will get a minus. So that's why I have minus out in front here, right? Okay? Good. So I, I can put in my uh, expressions that I had on the previous slide. So this is advective transport, diffusive transport. And then you see I have something here which is on the boundary dotted with the normal. And I can convert that into a volume integral by using essentially divergence theorem. So the, the idea is that if I have a closed body and I integrate how much stuff is going in, that has to be the rate at which material is accumulating inside. Okay, so this allows me to do this simple uh, mathematical manipulation and I get finally the advection diffusion equation by saying, well, if this is to hold for all volumes, then whatever is inside this integral has to be equal to that integral. And that's how you get the advection diffusion equation. And now a little later today, we will actually try to solve this equation in detail. But I'm just saying that in principle, if I were to go back to my this calculation, if I wanted to know in detail whether it's 150 or 157, I would have to know the exact geometry of my leaf and the space and information about the boundary layer. And then I'd have to solve this equation, which will couple concentration with uh, the flow field outside. And that is really not a simple problem. That's not something that we can do uh, even today. Really. Okay. So a little bit more about the process of, of, of getting water. And uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the wood microstructure because that's something that I find really fascinating. And uh, so if we look at a cross section of a stem over here on the left, basically most of it is xylem. So towards the center, uh, you see this dark ring. So that's sort of inactive old xylem. And there's this bright area, which is uh, currently used xylem. And then underneath the bark, you have the phloem. So phloem is sort of Greek for, for bark, and xylem is Greek for wood. So what you're sitting on right now literally is just a whole bunch of pipes. And they look, uh, this is an SEM picture of, of such a little area here, right? So you have all these little xylem pipes, and they carry water 
and uh, essentially they run continuously from one end to the other. You see there are some little holes here, and these holes link adjacent conduits, so they're called uh, bordered pit pores or pit areas, or they have pit membranes. We'll talk more in detail about how they work a little later today, but essentially they allow liquid to essentially go between one channel and the neighbor. Okay. I just wanted to show you uh, also one of my favorite books, which is this absolutely amazing book just with SEM pictures of plant wood. It's really remarkable. I highly recommend it. And uh, here it also shows some of the what happens. So this is, you should imagine, this is one cell, which is terminating here. Then it has some porous structure going into the next cell. So you can see the water can really sort of meander between these uh, conduits. Okay. So in this island for water transport, you have conduits that are roughly 100 microns in diameter, right? So that's somewhat comparable to a human hair. And uh, flow speed is like one millimeter a second, okay? So it's, it's a substantial current that you will have in a, in a tree. And of course, we know trees can get to, let's say, 100 meters. So the uh, second question of today is for you to discuss what pressure differences are needed to drive water flow in plants. Okay? And so just for comparison, I want to point out that like our blood pressure in human, uh, that's like uh, 0.1 atmosphere pressure. Okay? So it's, uh, that, that's just sort of to set the scale or something. Yeah. So please start discussing what you think is might be the... So what do you think? Is it more than blood pressure? Is it less than blood pressure? Is it as well or more? Okay. Why? I mean, you have capillaries in humans that are. Oh, good. Then you <laughs> make a Pascal. Good. 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 What? That's fine. That's fine. You know, remember the word make a Pascal. That's that's good. What 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 do you think? Is it more than blood pressure? Why? I mean, the, the, the pipes in our body are smaller than these, so some of them are, anyway. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah, I was thinking you have that as well, yeah. But that's like, uh, let's say, uh, yes, so you have many contributions you have to add, right? So you have to, if you just have rho GH, then you would have how much here if you have a 100 meter tree? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah? No, then you have a 100, right? Uh, row is 1,000. Right. Oh, okay. So the it's a million, right? So it's one million. So that's ten atmospheres already. <laughs> so that's just statically, if you want to just have it hanging there. Now we have to start moving it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that that's more like what's driving it, because you can only have capillary in one or a free surface at one position, right? You cannot have them all the way along. Just only in the leaf, maybe you can have a cap capillary effect. All right. So what, do you have some ideas? Like more than blood pressure, less than blood pressure? Maybe more, okay, yeah. <laughs> They're bigger organisms, right, anyway. So what time, what time is the break, roughly? Is it like? Uh, up to you, I mean, we'll take two minutes break and then. Okay, okay. All right, let's try to continue. Um, so what we were trying to discuss was like, what is the typical pressure difference needed to drive flow, water flow in, in plants, right? And obviously there are many effects that play into this, but today I just, or right now I just want to discuss whether or not it's maybe bigger or smaller than, uh, than uh, human blood pressure, right? Which is like 0.1 bar, 0.1 atmosphere, which is, a, I would say, a substantial pressure. So the interesting thing is that this blood pressure is essentially the same in, in all animals, 
Okay, so it's not like the elephant has super large uh, blood pressure, right? Uh, and the giraffe is using some special tricks because of the long neck, but otherwise, all may basically all plants from mouse to elephant, or all animals from, from mouse to elephant, have the same blood pressure. Uh, but so le let's let's try to uh, imagine that this plant xylem is just a perfect cylinder, okay? And there's no effect of gravity or anything. It's like lying down. Everything is ideal. So, in that case, we have this uh, Hakan Porse equation, which relates the flow rate in in such a cylindrical pipe to the pressure difference. So here the pressure difference is delta p. We have some material parameters which is the viscosity of the liquid. So essentially, the how viscous in this case, how viscous water is. So if it's uh, xylem sap, that's basically pure water with a few nutrients. If we talk about the phloem, it will be maybe twice the viscosity of water because you have sugar inside. But we also have the length L of the plant. And then you have the radius of the conduit. And the radius is to this power 4, meaning that uh, there is uh, quite a bit of penalty. So I see now that there is some disagreement about whether this is the wrong way around, which it is, I see <laughs> now. Right. So I was just testing whether someone here was being really clever. And uh, what you see here, I, 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 I got it right. So the pressure differential, if I do it in terms of velocity, now we know that there is a... Uh, uh, speed of one millimeter per second. So the pressure difference uh, is the pressure required to drive flow at a certain speed, which is proportional to how viscous it is, which makes sense physically. Like the more viscous, the more pressure I need to apply. The longer, the more pressure I need to apply. And the smaller the pipe, the more pressure I need to apply, right? So if I plug in the numbers here for uh, flow in a perfect cylindrical pipe, there are none of these pores between the conduits, there's no effect of gravity whatsoever, I get something like three bars, okay? Which is, uh, it's still, it's 30 times greater than human blood pressure, right? So it's just to illustrate that plants are doing something really amazing here, right? It's like uh, the pumping mechanisms they use, it cannot be muscles, okay? Because with simple muscle force, you cannot generate pressures of this kind and drive the, the types of volumetric flows. So plants are really unique in that they use chemical pumps. So they're really amazing chemical machines that use essentially evaporation in this case, which is essentially they're just using the fact that sun is heating the leaf, that generates evaporation, allows you to lower the pressure to drive this flow. All right. So, how do we actually derive this uh, pressure drop equation? And I want to, before we talked about uh, diffusion and advection, now I want to talk a little bit about fluid flow. And I think maybe you've s heard about this Navier-Stokes equation before. Did you hear about it? A lot. Okay. A lot. <laughs> Good. Good. So now I want to I, I want to talk uh, just for one or two slides about what it is and where it actually comes from, right? So essentially, uh, we have Newton's second law saying that uh, the mass times acceleration of an object is equal to the force on that object. Or you could say like the change in momentum, because maybe the, the particle can change mass as well, right? So it's the time derivative of the momentum, so it's a capital P here, it's equal to the force. So if I take some arbitrary uh, system, and I can say then I have a, a density of my liquid, so it could be air, it could be water, it doesn't matter in this case. So the momentum in, in any given direction, so here the index i, right, that's x, y, and z, for instance. It could also be some other cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates, it, it doesn't matter. So the momentum in any given direction is simply the local density times the local velocity in that direction, okay? And so just like we had before with the diffusive processes, where concentration can change due to a number of different effects, here momentum can change due to a number of different effects, okay? So it's the same principle. So the change in momentum can be either due to essentially convection. So again, it's like if I have a region 
with a lot of momentum over here that's moving into my zone of observation. So imagine you have this little potato in space. You have momentum moving in. That's what we call convection. So it can increase by this mechanism. It could be because of some pressure forces. If I have my object, pressure is a force that's always acting in a normal direction to the surface. It could be a viscous force. So viscosity is a force like when liquid planes are sliding against each other. So essentially you can transfer momentum in a tangential sense. And then it could also be a body force. So a good example of body force is gravity. could be electric forces and so on and so forth. So I can write down expressions for each of these. So convection, again, that's something like the velocity multiplied by density and so on. And pressure is the pressure integrated over the whole surface. Viscosity is all the viscous forces integrated over the whole surface and so on. So it looks like this. Um, so these are just each of the terms, convection, pressure force, and viscosity and body forces. And so you see uh, the change in momentum over here. I simply integrate the over the surface. So here we have something flowing in across the surface. Here we have something uh, pressure acting on the surface. Here we have viscous forces acting on the surface, and here we have body forces acting on the volume. Okay. And so what you do, you take an expression. So you assume something about the viscous force. So viscosity, as I said, is related to liquid sliding, like this. So the main assumption is just that it only depends on the on the gradient of velocity, okay? So there are many different models for more complicated fluids, but this is the, the simple version that, that we usually work with. And so if we do all this, and then we use this sort of divergence theorem again to convert everything, you see here some are bodies, so some are volume integrals, some are surface integrals. So use the same type of trick again. We get this Navier-Stokes equation. And so there are a number of terms here uh, that I just want to like, Again, summarize what they mean. So over here on the left-hand side, we have rho times something. So it's essentially the mass times acceleration term. So it's what you would call inertia. So if a body has a lot of momentum, it will keep on moving. And that's what is reflected in this, these terms over here. Then you have pressure force, and you have viscosity, and then some body forces. Could be gravity. Now, a really interesting uh, additional thing that we also need to do is to say, well, can we compress the liquid, right? So if, if you are in airflow at very high speeds or in water flow at very high speeds, you can get effects of compressibility, meaning essentially that this number, the density out in front here, is not constant. So you're allowed to squeeze the liquid together. So for the purposes of this talk, we'll assume that's not the case. So it basically means that the divergence of velocity has to be zero. So if I have a closed volume, I cannot add more material without also some of it flowing out, some other posi position. Okay. So these are the two basic governing equations, Navier-Stokes equation and the, and the divergence equation. And um, this is a, a very unfortunate equation. Okay. So I spend a lot of my time trying to solve this, and it's basically impossible. And so the reason is uh, right here. So you see there is a so-called nonlinear term. So if you, s if you write this out in Cartesian coordinates, then you get something, for instance, the velocity along the x direction multiplied by the gradient of the velocity along the x direction. So you get some nonlinear term, which is an absolute pain to work with. Okay, so, so we have to sort of say it's better to try to estimate, well, how big is this term going to be relative to that, relative to that, relative to that. And then we can get rid of some of them and maybe simplify our life a little bit. And so to do that, uh, one particular class of problems can be solved by looking at the Reynolds number, which is just uh, essentially the ratio of how important an inertia is to how important viscosity is. Okay. So essentially, I take this term. So that will be roughly the density multiplied by uh, velocity squared divided by the characteristic length scale of the problem. And then I divide it by the viscosity here. And so the characteristic magnitude of this viscous force is just uh, viscosity, which is the material parameter, and then multiplied by speed divided by length scale squared, right? That's roughly how big this derivative will be. So I get this number, the Reynolds number, rho VL divided by eta. 
So if we look at what it is, so like if you are out swimming, uh, you have a Reynolds number of roughly like one million, okay? So in that case, like the viscous drag on your body is really not that important, okay? It's more the pressure term and the inertia term which we need to include in our calculation. So if you want to, you were interested in swimming people, like the ones on the picture there, you could basically throw away this term in your calculation. That would be accurate. Now, if I'm interested in plants or some of this lab on check technology that I'm also interested in, 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 in designing and working with, the Reynolds number is sort of less than, less than one. So here it's 0.1, roughly, for uh, flows of uh, one millimeter second and, and conduits of 100 microns. So for a flow in xylem, it will be roughly 0.1. So in this case, you see the Reynolds number characterizes how important all these terms here are. So basically, uh, this will be at least 10 times as great. Okay. So essentially, the idea is to say we can totally disregard the inertia and the effects of that. If we look at even smaller length scales, like inside individual cells or swimming cells, the Reynolds number becomes even smaller. So that's... that's uh okay. So now, before the coffee break, I just want to briefly show, like, how do you go from the Navier-Stokes equation to this Hagen per se relationship, right? So I now have only pressure terms and viscosity terms in my equation, and I have this pipe. So it has some radius A, length L, and a pressure difference delta P applied across. And I assume the velocity is only along the Z direction, so along the pipe, sort of from left to right up here. So that is what I write over here. The velocity in the z direction is only a function of r. Okay, so I have translational invariants along the pipe. I have rotational symmetry, so it doesn't depend on the angle of rotation up here. And so there are three equations up here. So I have dp dz, and then the the uh, uh, r and 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 z components here. I basically only have to worry about this. Okay, so I can solve this, so I get the, the pressure uh, term here, and I get the velocity field, and then I get the flow rate, right? In this case, it's correct. So we have the flow rate increases with the radius of height, thank you, and decreases with viscosity and, and, and pressure drop. And of course, if I have an actual xylem pipe, the geometry will be much more complicated, but this is a good place to start to say, okay, to look for deviations from this law. So just a brief comment about how we actually utilize these types of formula. Uh, the basic structure of a lot of hydrodynamics can be formulated in terms of hydraulic resistance. So essentially you see you have flow rate, you have some coefficient here which depends on the geometry, and then you have applied pressure. Okay. So just like in sort of electrical engineering where the Voltage, so this is Ohm's law. The applied voltage is equal to current times resistance. You have the same type of relation in fluid mechanics. Okay? And basically, the all the currents have to sum to zero in electrical systems. All the currents have to sum to zero in fluidic. The power dissipated, it's all the same. You can generate, you can analyze fluid transport networks using these hydraulic resistors in exactly the same way as you would with electrical systems. And you get these nice, so I mean, sort of the, the, the take-home message from this graph, for instance, is that flow rate is proportional to applied pressure, which is a nice and sort of good qualitative thing to understand, that if I double the pressure, I double the flow rate. Um, yes. And so just so beyond plants, these uh, types of microfluidic analyses are obviously also important in other areas. So from basically our vascular system, a lot of work has been, been done on this. One of the papers I uploaded discusses in details um, that type of flow problem. You can also analyze basically problems down to essentially the nanometer scale. So people have analyzed flow in aquaporin proteins, for instance, using the same formalism, and it works remarkably well. Okay. So I think it's time for a coffee break. Right? Okay. Let's start again. <laughs>
So now we, I just, uh, in the last hour or so, I spoke about the process of getting water from the soil and uh, the reasons why you need so much water. And obviously what the plan is all about is making these sugars. So if you look at the a tree like this, the root network is branched and in structure can be compared to the crown. It extracts all this water and then sunlight comes in and you have photosynthesis. Okay, and so you need to redistribute the products of photosynthesis. And this happens in a separate pipe network. So if we this is a cross section of a stem and sort of uh, just in the bark layer, we have a network of cells called the phloem, which are these sugar transporting mm, conduits. Okay, and they also basically span the length of the plant. And there's an important difference between xylem and phloem that I just want to emphasize here. And so xylem conduits are these sort of 100 micron large cells that are dead when they are operational. Okay, they don't have cell membrane, nucleus, anything like that. That's all dissolved away. And they're just sitting there and then they're used for a few years, a season or two, and then they sort of go, uh, they, 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 uh, a new layer is added every year. Uh, and so the phloem is very different. Okay, These are living cells that have cell membranes and they have a cytoplasm. So it's a little bit modified in the sense that they have what, you, what we call companion cells. So they the production of proteins, the nucleus, and so on, is sitting outside in these companion cells, which are sort of feeding into the pipes. Right? But the core difference is that xylem do not have cell membrane. The phloem has a cell membrane. Okay? And then you link all these cells together and dissolve away the end walls. Then you have basically one giant elongated cytoplasmic tube. Okay? That is what the phloem is. So... Uh, a good question is how do you drive transport of the sugar? Because we saw earlier that uh, uh, evaporation drove transport of water, okay? And that requires some, a few bars of pressure just to drive the liquid flow in a perfect pipe. No effect of gravity, no effect of getting it out of the soil and so on, right? So the question is what about sugar, okay? So because these cells are uh, relatively uh, they're because they're different than xylem, okay, that you have to keep them alive, then they are relatively small. So most, in most cases, the diameter is a few microns, maybe one to ten microns, right? So let's say a typical diameter is five microns. And the flow rate is, is uh, smaller than water flow, so it's basically like a hundred microns a second. So 0.1 millimeter a second, that's typical flow speed that you find in the floor. And so we can use that to compute the pressure difference. So as, as we did before, we have the viscosity of the liquid here. We have the length of the pipe. We have the radius of the pipe. And we have the speed. So we can use this to, to compute the pressure difference. So it turns out to be pretty dramatic. So in this case, you need a pressure of one megapascal. That's just to drive the flow inside a perfect pipe. Okay. And so this is not 30 times greater than human blood pressure, but 100 times greater than human blood pressure. Right? So this is really is a remarkable feat of engineering to design this pipe network that runs at such an elevated pressure. Okay. So how does it? How do how do you generate this type of pressure? And um, essentially, well, maybe you don't need pressure, right? So there are, could be some other ways of driving flow. And so what I show here is a, a movie that I took of of cytoplasmic streaming. So it's inside an algae, but the idea is that some uh, many plant cells also have essentially muscle fibers. So in this, in this cell, there are muscle fibers sitting uh, on along the periphery, and they essentially pull on the liquid. And I mean, you, you can see this is 100 microns, so you can generate transport over long distances by using essentially muscles. Right? And this happens in many plant cells. So to circulate the cytoplasm, to mix things around, you see this process. Um, but it doesn't happen in the phloem, okay? So these sort of muscle-like structures are not found in the phloem. Another possibility could be so-called electroosmosis. So essentially you can use uh, differences in membrane potential to drag ions uh, 
and that would then in pull on the liquid and you can pump liquid using such mechanisms. So many of these have been proposed. Uh, so uh, a fundamental question is then, okay, so we can try to say, well, it's pressure driven, that's our best hypothesis, but then you have to measure the pressure actually, right, to show that you, you have this one megapascal gradient. And I want to talk a little bit about what the state of the art of measuring pressure inside plants, inside the flow mills. And essentially, we use, uh, until recently, uh, people used this guy. So this is an aphid. So it's like a lice for, for a plant or a mosquito for a plant. And you, what this guy is doing, it has a, it's a little insect and it has a stylet right here. Right? And here is a cross section. This is a, a maize leaf. This is the stylet, and you see it penetrates the tissue without puncturing the cells, and then it finds the phloem and goes into just this one cell, and then it can drink the sap. Okay. Many, many insects wants, want, want to do this because the sap has concentration of 20% sugar. So what is the concentration of sugar in Coca-Cola? Does anyone remember? More? Good. Any higher? No? So the concentration of sugar in Coca-Cola is roughly 10%. So Fanta is a little bit higher. I think it's one of the highest, like 1% more. But uh, So this is a very sweet and very really highly energetic liquid, right? So that, ma that many animals. So what the aphid is doing is that it has, inside this diet, it has one channel for saliva that it's uh, pumping in to prevent wound response and then sucking out the sap with another one. Anyway, here's a movie of what that looks like. So there's a, a, a friend of mine, uh, Peter Minchin, who is in New Zealand, and he's doing this experiment. So because the aphid is feeding on the leaf, and now we would like to use this stylet, or he would like to use the stylet, for the purpose of measuring the pressure or extracting the sap or, or, uh, uh, and so on. And so what we need to interface with the plant is a little uh, knife here. It's an ultrasonic knife. And uh, it can be used to cut the stylet in this manner. So this is the cut stylet. And you see the liquid coming out, and the insect goes away. Uh. Okay. And of course, the, the, this can be used for multiple things, not only measuring the pressure by attaching a sensor, but also collecting the sap and analyzing its, its, its composition. But here is one way that one can interface with it. You, you can, you can uh, collect the liquid. And so essentially, by attaching a pressure transducer to this pipe, you can measure the, the pressure inside the foam. Now, the, the problem with this is obviously that it's extremely laborious. And there's one species of aphid per plant. So it's not you cannot do a wide range of plants using uh, the same, same techniques. So recently, in collaboration with uh, uh, no block lab at Washington State University. We developed these sort of very simple uh, pressure sensors, which is a essentially it's a glass capillary filled with a compressible oil. And so this out here is water. This is the compressible oil. You see, you penetrate the phloem cell, and this oil water interface moves. And if you know the sort of compressibility of the oil, you can calculate what was the the pressure inside. So this is a phloem cell. This is a stomata guard cell, so it works on pretty small cells as well. And the point is that when you make these, so if you want to measure pressure, which is 100 atmospheres, uh, generally speaking, uh, that is a relatively large pressure for a biological system. So your sensor will be affected by this pressure. So if you take a conventional like macroscopic pressure sensor, then the change in volume of your sensor will be comparable to the volume of the cell. So it will completely lose its pressure. And so what we did with these was we were able to scale down. So you can essentially make them as small as you want. So you can measure pressures in cells that are sort of a guard cell serial element sizes. Okay. <coughs> 
And so that is what we did on these. So it's a morning glory. It's a vine plant. So essentially we measure the pressure in the leaf and we measure the pressure down here in the root. And then you can sort of see how that uh, evolves. And I plot it here as a function of the size of the organism because you saw before that the pressure required to drive flow changes the size. So we, we saw that was a nice variable to measure. So this is the absolute pressure in this lowest leaf. And you see as it uh, five meters, you have around one megapascal. And then if it's 50 meters long, you have around two megapascal inside the floor and up here. Uh, and then if you subtract the pressure in the root, so you have sort of the difference, the pressure difference, that's always what's important. You get something like something like this, right? So in a short plant, you don't need a lot of pressure, so you don't measure a lot of pressure. But in a 15 meter plant, you can easily generate uh, 1.5 megapascal. So 150 times our blood pressure, that's no problem for the plant. Okay. So I think we nailed down the mechanism that's driving transport. Now we need to talk about what is actually generating this pressure. And so that's a question. Yes. Correct. So the xylem uh, runs under tension, so essentially negative pressure, which is allowed in a liquid, right? But the, the phloem here runs under positive pressure. So if you puncture a hole in the plant, the principle it should ooze out, right? Okay. So the mechanism uh, which which is responsible for uh, Schubert transport is, is uh, named after a German botanist, Ernst Münch, who proposed uh, an osmotic mechanism. So essentially the idea is that you want to transport the sugars, so why not use the chemical energy of the sugars to transport the sugars? So the idea is simply that in the source, in the leaf up here, we accumulate a lot of sugars into a cell. This means that the potential of the water the chemical potential of the water that you dissolve all these uh, solutes in will go down. So it will essentially attract water from surrounding tissue. So the water is supplied by the xylem, so it will be sucked into the phloem, and that will s essentially just push the sugar to wherever it's needed. So it's a super clever system. You can only push to regions where sugars are consumed, and you use the chemical energy of the sugars themselves to power transport of sugars. So get the best of everything. And so the pressure difference you can generate with this type of flow is uh, potentially RT delta C. So R is the gas constant, T is temperature, and delta C is the difference in concentration between these two regions that you're trying to pump between. Okay, so essentially the leaf is this osmotic pump, and I, I thought I'd show some experiments sort of illustrating how it actually works. So here's uh, an artificial leaf which is a dialysis tube that I filled with uh, a solution of sugar and dye here. And so the dialysis tube continues up here. It's about one centimeter diameter tube. Outside, I have a larger glass tube, which is filled with pure water. Okay, and so this is the initial stage of the experiment. And you see, I, I like you should imagine that I take one of these veins in here. I take the phloem cell out, and then I put some sugar in, then let's see what happens, okay? So essentially, this is what happens. So you see that the blue dye, the blue dye is mixed with the sugar. So imagine that you're seeing the sugar moving. The blue dye is pushed out of the leaf, or pushed up in this case, and diluted at the same time, right? So essentially, what's happening is that water from the in the glass tube out here, it's just pure water, it moves across this membrane. And the mem this membrane has the same property as the cell membrane in that it allows water to move, but not sugars. Okay. At the very end here, you see my experiment failing miserably. Right? You see this, this my dialysis tube basically breaks up. You can even see some blue dye leaking into the, into the glass tube out here. So that's just to illustrate that you get very large pressures doing this. Okay. So you see initially, it moves very nicely from one end to the other. And then because the system is closed, eventually the pressure will build up so much that my dialysis tube will deform plastically and in the end do this sort of buckling and finally release and destroy the experiment. But it just shows that the pressure is extremely large. 
This obviously does not happen in a plant. There, at all times, the membrane is pushed against the cell wall. So now if we do the numbers and say you have one molar concentration, uh, concentration difference, which is not unreasonable for the phloem, you get that you can, can generate pressures of 2.5 megapascal, so 25 atmospheres. So this is like if you dissolve 350 grams of sugar in a liter of water, then you get a potential driving force of this magnitude, which is quite remarkable, I think. And so these, uh, I mean, I have done sort of artificial experiments of this kind, but it's actually in this, uh, in this paper by Munch from 1927. He did the experiment back then, a macroscopic experiment, but that, that's like he really demonstrated that this mechanism works, and it's quite a good paper. I, re I recommend that. All right, so let's just see. 